As a country in the grip of poverty and a devastating HIV pandemic, causing a declining population, with many children left orphaned or abandoned, Swaziland was desperate for hope. A glimmer of hope stirred in a couple, Kevin and Helen Ward, who could no longer walk past the street children without doing something to help. Kevin answered God's call for him to leave the family business at Mountain Inn to begin ministering by reaching out to the least and to the most disadvantaged. He was led by God to Msunduza, where there were hundreds of street children living around the local Shabin. While ministering God's word, many adults and children would stand outside the drinking house and listen. It was clear that many children could not afford to go to school and there was a desperate need to start a soup kitchen and to take time to minister to these children who were living on the street. At this time, an opportunity arose to rent a property on Johnson Street. So we're here on Johnson Street and 20 years ago, this building was Club 701, a very seedy, dark nightclub. In fact, this whole street was just full of bars and nightclubs. It was a dangerous street to walk down. So we felt God call us to turn this place of darkness into a place of light in Ember Barn. And this is where the ministry started. After some paint and time investment, the bar was transformed and they could start holding church meetings in the building. Each morning, they were concerned about the 15 children they found sleeping in a two square meter area outside the building. 14 out of the 15 children tested positive for HIV AIDS. These children's family units had broken down and so they had run onto the streets to find security. But instead, they only found more abuse and suffering. So whilst one of the children was taking a shower, and there was a long line of children coming to collect clothes, take a shower, put on the new clothes, get their food, one of the children screamed. I went running around the building to find the nurse was attending the child, and young Innocent, his name was Innocent, had taken a shower and soap had gone into the ulcerated areas of his body. His mother had passed away. His grandmother was alive. No one was available to care for him. They didn't have funds. What had happened is little innocent had been pushed across to live with another man. The man had abused him. And uh, as a result, innocent was angry, went onto the streets during the day, sucked glue because he couldn't live with himself. He masked his pain by inhaling glue. And the consequence of glue and the lifestyle of being abused was that his areas had been ulcerated and so the soap got into those areas. It was this scream, this dreaded scream that woke my world up. I was not exposed, had not been exposed to this world and I suddenly realized it was no longer good enough just to provide food and clean clothes. We had to provide a safe, secure Christian home to get these children off the street. They found a safe haven in nine stick and mud houses that were 16 square meters each. These were owned by Kevin's father who graciously let them use them for the children. The kitchen was made of corrugated iron with a wood fire stove and the toilet was a pit latrine. The meals for the 45 children who were rescued off the street consisted of donated beans for breakfast, lunch and supper. Hi, I'm Mongani Lukele. I'm in full-time ministry at Porter's Wheel Church. Um, I think I want to be a businessman, but I also feel like I'm called to be a pastor. But uh, the good thing is I know God has a great plan for my life, and He will lead me. My life has not always been like this. I've never known my father, and my mother left me when I was six. I stayed with my aunt, who was a witch doctor, for a year. At the age of seven, I left her to live with my friends. There were bigger boys who started teaching me how to smoke and drink. To support the habits of smoking and drinking, we would break into people's houses and steal. And I was the smallest, so I would fit into battle proofs and doors. When the police came though, the big boys would leave me in the house and just run away. Then the police would catch me beat me and torture me for information and one of the ways was to put me in the river in the middle of the night and when I was soaking wet they would pull me out and beat me 
trying to get information, but I, would, I wouldn't give out the names of the same people who would protect me in times of trouble. And so the police would let me go after the beating because I was still a kid at seven, eight years old, they wouldn't arrest me. 1996, 97, Challenge Ministry started giving out soup like uh, pop and beans for lunch in the streets. They had a soup kitchen there. But after the lunch, they would share the word of God with us. And so we would go there, but after that, we'd go back into the streets, into smoking and drinking and stealing, just doing all the bad things that kids do in the streets. But 1998, they started a residential center at Mafini, where I left the streets. I was privileged enough to be one of the first people to walk into a Teen Challenge Center. So when Teen Challenge started giving out food for lunch, like beans and, and pap, they saw that that wasn't enough because after the meals we would go back into the streets and the habits were not broken. So a residential place was provided for us at a Mafini Center, where the Rehab Center is now. And one of the highlights I had there was the Word of God for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. For every meal, also the Word of God was provided. Well, I, I, I had a few challenges now and again because living in the streets, I wasn't used to authority, and so I, I didn't really take kind to authority at Challenge Ministries. But by the grace of God, I managed to pull through. These stick and mud houses eventually became the Emufini Teen Challenge Men's Center as God's gracious provision made it possible to start a rehabilitation center to free the youth of drug and solvent dependence. My father was from Mozambique. There was a civil war in Mozambique to escape it. He moved into Swaziland. That's how he met up with my mother. Um, at a very tender age, I was about two years old, and my father committed a very serious crime in Swaziland, and he was being pursued by the police. Um, he ran away, um, dove into a river, uh, and the, the, the police, they besieged the river, and gasping for his breath, he surfaced his head above the water, and that's how he died, and they shot him on the spot. When my mother heard the news, um, she was very devastated because she was a housewife. She didn't have work. Um, so she was literally forced and relegated by circumstances to move the whole family uh, into the streets. I have, four I have two sisters and one brother, and I'm the third oldest. So she moved us into the streets um, of Mbabane. The, the streets were very, very difficult for us. It was literally the survival of the fetus. Um, to get food, um, we used to steal, uh, break into people's houses. My brother uh, joined the notorious gang, the most notorious gang uh, in the streets. Um, and I was looking up to him. Um, and so I ended up in the gang myself. My brother joined a notorious gang in the streets and he was literally spending more time in prison than he was with us. In the midst of all this confusion, um, my sister gave birth at the age of 13, literally on the streets um, to a beautiful child and she she literally came and just dumped the baby with me. I was high on drugs, I couldn't look after myself, later on another human being. So it was very devastating for me. Um, I didn't really have a choice, but I took the child um, into the marketplace and just left him there um, with some ladies that I had known. <sighs> at an earlier stage, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional, which is unusual. Um, at a later stage, I also joined the same gang that my, my brother was, was leading. Um, got arrested, um, was in prison, got out of prison, and I just knew that I needed to change. Um, but I didn't know what to do, I didn't know where to go. Uh, a friend of mine told me about the lighthouse and Teen Challenge at the time, and 
I wasn't interested because they, he had made it abundantly clear that um, you have to work for your meals. And if a man doesn't work, he must not eat. I thought, garbage, you know, this is nonsense. I, I don't have to work in the streets, I just have to take from you. Um, and so I, I turned his offer away, um, but somehow, somewhere I knew that um, there was God, as strange as, as it sounds right now, I knew that there was God and he was constantly with me and I could just feel his presence and there was this prompting at the time I didn't know what it was. And I remember walking into the, into the lighthouse for the very first time. Um, the people there, they were just absolutely amazing. Um, they, they had something that I didn't have. They had Jesus Christ and I just longed to be like them. And I remember this lady coming up to me and giving me a hug. And, and, and I, I was like, how strange is it that she doesn't even know me and yet she's loving on me. And she told me, you know, about this Jesus, and, and, and I was like, okay, lady, you're going a bit too, too far now. I'm not interested in your Jesus. I'm just here for the meals. I'm here for the free meals. But, you know, uh, she was very convincing. I was like, okay, fine, I'll give him a chance. So I remember um, just her vicious smile was irresistible. And, and she prayed with me. Um, and I remember the day I gave my life to Jesus in 1999. When I walk into Tun Challenge, I was literally skin and bone. Um, they used to call me Sticks because I was so skinny. <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> I have this wheelbarrow that I have to push around. Uh, used to have a, you know, a nice six pack, and now all I have is a one pack. Um, and so, I, I, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I had no education before I came to Teen Challenge. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I never had the opportunity to go to school because you don't go to school when you're in the streets. And so the first book that I read that they gave me when I came to the lighthouse was the Bible. And I looked at the Bible and I went through it and I had no understanding of what was written in there, but I literally cuddled with that book every night. And, and gradually the Holy Spirit directly began to teach me how to read and how to write by reading the Bible. And that is a complete miracle. And so that's just one of the things that the Lord has done uh, for me. And I'm, I'm really excited to be able to stand here and to share that victory with you guys. I, I, no, Teen Challenge wasn't really the end for me. It was only the beginning. You know, I, I've completed Bible studies. Um, I've, I was at one point the worship leader here at Portersville. Um, and now God has blessed me with the most beautiful uh, woman on earth, I believe. Uh, and a beautiful daughter. And he has also entrusted me with his highest sentimental value, which is his people. We're running a church in Bulembu Church. Uh, I think it's about 500 people that are there. And that's just a miracle that God has done. You know, the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, everything has become new. And that's what God has done for my life. He's completely changed me. And I am not the person that I used to be because of the transformation that has taken place. Musa's story echoes the plight of so many children that we found on the streets of Embuan, where rejection had caused such devastating hurt that each one was desperate for hope, each one was needing help towards a better future, each one was needing healing with every child that we met on the streets, we realized how great, how substantial the need was. One story stands out as a key moment. I was in a prayer meeting in Imaban when there was a knock on the door and uh, the social worker for Imaban, who then became the Deputy Prime Minister of Swaziland, was at the door. I went to greet her and she asked me if I could meet a young man that needed some help. I went to the door expecting a young man of 14 or 15 years old and found 
a nine-year-old boy. I'll call him John for his own security. John's mother was dying of HIV AIDS. His father had died of AIDS and none of the family members were prepared to look after the child. Constance asked me to look after this young man and she said he's not a boy, he's a young man. That uh, every morning he gets up and sells fruit and veg in a place like this. With the fruit and veg that he sells, he makes profit. With a profit, he leaves his home, which is in Nimsunduza, a tin shack, catches a bus 40 kilometers down to Manzini, where he would feed his mom. He would cook a meal and feed his mother at nine years old. He would wash her and he would read one verse a day to her. When I heard that story, I realized not only was government asking us to take care of this child officially, take care of children coming from a background of HIV and AIDS, but God was too. How could I, as a Christian, consider myself to be a Christian and not provide a home for this nine-year-old child? Here this nine-year-old child was looking after his mother, was cooking for his mother, was washing his mother, was running a small business for his mother. Therefore I, as a Christian, at 30 years old at the time, should, should have to do the same. I felt compelled and led of the Lord to do this. This was of the Lord. Moved by John's plight and with only 4,000 Rand, the first children's home was started in a rented house. Social welfare continued to bring children, like little John, into the home. While there, they received a very generous gift from the Palmer family, who provided four houses in Isolwini, known as 10 Downing Street. The children lived there until Teen Challenge UK, through John Macy, came across to purchase a 15-acre farm at Hawani for new children's homes to be built. 10 Downing Street then became a life skills center and later Elisutweni Teen Challenge Center for Abused Women. The most important part of the healing process for the ladies at the Women's Center is for them to come to a place of forgiveness for what they have been through. What God has taught me through Challenge Ministries Swaziland is the power of forgiveness. How God can use a broken vase for His glory and how God can actually use a bruised reed to reflect His glory and His beauty. So when I joined Challenge Ministries nine years ago, I was a broken woman. I was broken indeed because I was from a very, very abusive marriage. My marriage was filled with a lot of fights. There was just abuse everywhere. And my husband was having a lot, a lot of affairs. So that really hurt me a lot because there was a lot of beating. There was a lot of verbal abuse, emotional abuse. And in the midst of all that, I discovered I was living with HIV AIDS. Twice he tried to kill me. I decided it's enough. I am going to die and I cannot allow the enemy to win. So I walked away. When I joined Challenge Ministries, I was very broken. I was confused. My children were confused. They didn't know what had happened. I had lost my own identity. They had also lost their identity. Everything was just dead. There was no hope in my life. The doctors had told me I've got only 17 CD4 count. And I think they were scared to tell me that you will die. Challenge Ministries ministered to me, but it wasn't easy because I had created a wall where I didn't want anybody to be there. I had created a wall in such a way that whoever will ask me how I was doing, I'll be quick to say I am fine with a very strong face saying don't go near, I'm just okay like that. But as days, months, years went by, I started to hear the word of God. I started to receive the teachings that were given in the church. I want to tell you that when I came, due to HIV, I had lost my sense of smell. So many things were just not right with my health. And I was just thinking the other day saying, how brave 
Pastor Kevin and Helen were, to take me and work here because I was really looking bad. But because they knew that God can do anything, they were bold enough to welcome me here and allow me to work. As I continued with the journey, but I still felt like I had every reason to be angry. I cannot forgive this man for all the things he had done because he stripped me naked. He took away everything. I didn't have even a home. I didn't have even a teaspoon under my name. I came just as I was to this place. I had nothing and my kids had nothing. But God made sure that he wants me to see who he was. He wanted me to see that he is indeed my husband. He started ministering into my life. I started breaking down those walls and allowing the ministers to speak into my life. I then decided, I chose, I am going to forgive. I am going to forgive and release. Because my one thing was that how can this man not even care where we are? He doesn't even know what his children are eating. He doesn't even know the grade they are in at school. So I was very angry. But God said, let me show you who I am. Your children will never lack. And indeed, they never lacked. He said, you will not lack. And indeed, I never lacked. I continued in the journey of forgiving. I released. I said, Lord, I choose today to forgive this man still living with HIV, I continued in the journey. But I just remember that the minute I decided to forgive him and release him, I knew I am not going back to him because of my safety. But I said, Lord, I am forgiving this man. I am releasing him to you. Things started changing. I started seeing God in a different way. As I walked around, I could hear, like, there, I could feel there was this weight that has been taken off my shoulders. And then the leaders of this ministry asked me, can you lead and be the manager of the Women's Center? Wow. I took that offer. And it was so surprising. It's like God wanted me to see what he can do with a broken heart. What God can do with a heart that is in pain. I saw that. I saw a lot of transformation with those women. There's just a lot of things that I saw in them, what God was doing. And most of the time I'll say, I know you did it with me, God. I know you can do it with them. Each time I receive a student, I admit a, stu a student to, to, to the program, I will pray for them and say, Lord, I know how I came here. I know how bad I was when I came here, but you've done something with my life. And I know that even today you'll do the same with this woman that I am admitting today. And I've seen so many miracles. As time went by, the leadership again, under God's grace, asked me now to be the head of Pastoral Care in Portersville Church. And all that is God's glory, it's God's grace. I said earlier on that when I came, I had nothing. I had no car under my name. I had no teaspoon under my name. I had no home. But God is great. He is such an awesome God. Standing here today, I'm proud to say I've got a home. God has built a home for me. I always say God knows better than we do. He knew that I am a woman. How can I even build that house? So he built that house for me. I thank God. I said earlier on when I came, the husband has took, he took everything away from me. But this year, he gave me a car. We are not in a relationship, but he came and gave me a car. And I know that is God's restoration. My children, because I chose to forgive, they are also walking under that forgiveness in my house. There is always joy in my house. Even with me, people always ask me, you're always bubbly tops. You're always bubbly. And I tell them, it's because you don't know what the Lord has done in my life. I know, I know how it is to be in pain. And I know how, how it is to be in freedom. I just want to say, I've really seen the hand of the Lord in my life. Lastly, I said earlier on, I had HIV AIDS and my city for count was only 17. But today I want to share with you this evening that standing here, the doctors have several times told me HIV is undictatable in my system. And 
And I know it is God's doing. I know it is the power of the living God. Thank you very much. Hawani Children's Homes continue to grow with up to 100 children on the property in homes of six to eight children per house cared for by a house mother. The list of children needing a home continued to grow and God again provided a solution. KPMG liquidators approached CMS to ask them if they would consider buying Bulembu, an abandoned mining town. And so the story of Bulembu began with a trip to the town where it was agreed it was a possible solution to accommodating children in a secure and safe environment. Donations in 2006 from Canada, USA, Challenge Ministries and most notably Neil Reichenberg, here in Swaziland as the largest investor, made the purchase of Bulembu possible. A new partnership was formed between CMS and BMS. CMS was able to take 100 children from Hawani up to Bulembu to begin the homes there in what is now known as Bulembu Ministry Swaziland. These two ministries are blessed to share the same board of directors. My name is Bongani Kumalo and I was brought up in the, in the capital city of Swaziland. And my, in my family, I'm the only boy in the family and four, four, four sisters. I have four sisters and my mother died on, when I was on the age of four, five. And it was kind of like a very, very, very hard uh, situation for me to bear. And also my dad decided to turn away from Christianity and become a traditional healer. When he was doing his traditional healing, to those who don't know what traditional healing is, they actually go, is a person who they really go to for good luck or for some other cases or for sicknesses. So well, the way they do it is uh, they actually cut people's skins to, to just apply the, the traditional medicine that they want to apply into their skin. So my dad do it, did it with me and he didn't know that the, the razor blade that he actually used on me was actually an often infected person that was actually used on an infected person. And it wasn't quite of uh, an easy, easy situation for me because I got sick after that for five years. I couldn't eat, I couldn't move, and my sisters tried to take me places only to find out that I'm HIV positive. It was kind of like a very uneasy situation for me because I really knew that somehow I wouldn't be accepted on other people or somehow I wouldn't get a wife when I grow old because some other people are too, are, too, are too discriminative. But I always trusted the Lord because I knew Him from a young stage. But it's just that it was not tangible in my life. So there came a time during the year of 2010 whereby I had to come, come to Bulembu. It was a kind of a life-changing life experience because I then got to meet some other people who were so encouraging into my life. While Bulembu continued to develop as a place of hope and restoration, one home and one school at a time, God gave Kevin a further vision to reach rural areas in Swaziland. Through planting churches in rural areas, they were able to reach the most deprived communities. In addition to a church, they built a pastor's home, a children's home for orphaned and vulnerable children, as well as a preschool. Many of the surrounding families in these areas are severely affected by HIV AIDS and have suffered great loss. By planting these in-community by community churches, they were able to provide assistance and to teach primary health care and first aid in and through the local church. Any child being abused in that area could be referred by social welfare to that church and any child that needed to be extracted for his or her own safety could be taken to Bulembu. Today, 10 ICBCs have been planted with a long-term vision to establish 60 ICBCs throughout Swaziland. The ICBC vision was set in motion. Bulembu was growing from strength to strength. The men's program was turning out wonderful young men of tremendous character who became a blessing to their communities. The Women's Center was seeing women restored to their true identity and purpose. Yet still, God was saying there was more. 
And so, nine years after CMS started, it was time to plant Potter's Wheel Church, which began in Cooper Center with a handful of congregation members. As Potter's Wheel Church grew, it moved to Emma Feeney Conference Center. Potter's Wheel Church now serves as the administrative central head office for Bulembu Ministries, Bulembu Enterprise, Emma Feeney Men's Center, LS20 Women's Center, Hawani Children's Homes, and the In Community by Community projects throughout Swaziland. Thank you for joining with us over the last 20 years. It's been a privilege to see the lives that have been impacted, the lives that have been changed, and seeing changed lives, change lives. But the story has just begun. As we look at Bulembo Ministries and Challenge Ministries becoming one family, synergizing, working together underneath one board with one vision to reach the nation for kingdom transformation one life at a time, we're excited to see the next 20 years of the children and the leaders being developed into significant people of influence, filled with wisdom, filled with grace, filled with leadership skills because of your journey with us. We're excited for the next 20 years. We are better together. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you for helping us because each testimony, each gift of life that you see impacted and changed is really your victory too. Through you helping us to make it possible to see kingdom transformation one life at a time. Thank you.